Uh, there's an expression, a very common expression that many of us use, and it's this, is scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And that statement is a very simple summary of a relational principle called reciprocity. And reciprocity, uh, we get the word reciprocal, means this. If you do something good for me, I then feel obligated to do something good for you. On the flip side, if you do something to harm me or hurt me or cause me pain, then I feel like I've got to do something to cause you pain. So it's reciprocal. Like if you do something good for me, I do something good for you. If you do something to hurt me and cause pain, then I'll do something to hurt and cause pain to you. Now here's the problem with that is sometimes when we want to get back at people for the pain they've caused us, for the offense they've caused us, some of the ways that we can get back at them are actually illegal and can get us thrown in jail, can get us thrown in prison. But what I want to do briefly this morning is share with you how to get away with murder, how to get away with giving back and paying back somebody for the pain they've caused you without you going to jail, without you being indicted and arrested. And I've got a good friend of mine, he's a former Harris County District Attorney, and all these things will fly. So the first thing is this, when someone hurts you, when someone causes you pain, you can murder their character, you can murder their image. And this is the way you can do it. You can do that by slander and gossip. You can do it if you're a Christian, and I know slander and gospel is wrong, we would never do that. The way you can do that is through sharing prayer requests about that person that subtly undermine their character and their image. And for those of you who uh, perhaps are in a community group, another way to do this is a thing that we call nowadays venting, venting. You know what, I'm just venting to my small group. I'm just venting to the people at Bayou City. I'm just venting, getting some things off my chest. And by doing that, you can murder somebody's character and murder somebody's image. That's one way you can do it. And here's the thing. If you're in community group and you're venting to your community group about maybe an elder or another member of Bayou City or somebody at your work, the, the, the Harris County Sheriff is not gonna come to your community group and say, you know what? Texas Penal Code Section 3, Subletter 4, Roman numeral 5 says that if you're in a community group and you're venting, you can be arrested and indicted. That's not against the law. It's not a misdemeanor or a felony. Or here's another way. You can murder the relationship. If someone has hurt you or caused you pain, you can kill the relationship. You can murder the relationship. How do you do that? You can just give them the cold shoulder. When you see them, you just walk away. If you're on social media, you can unfriend them. You can block them to try to get back at them. Maybe you're going to have a party for your anniversary or birthday. You know what you do? You invite all the other people except them so that they can feel a little bit of your pain. And again, the constable's not going to come to your birthday party and say, counting all the people, I noticed that you didn't invite Mary or Bill because you're trying to get back them. That's a misdemeanor, and I'm going to arrest you and take you to jail and have you pay a fine. You will never get arrested for that. And the other way is this. You can murder them in your fantasy world in your mind. You can have anger towards them and hatred towards them and ill will towards them. You can, you can kind of stalk them on social media, and when you see that they're going through an illness or they've lost their job, you can say, yes, they got what they deserve. And you can rejoice in the fact that now they're going through pain. And so inside, you can be just seething with this anger and bitterness towards them. And you know what? You will never be arrested for that. Never be arrested. The Houston Police Department will not come to your work and say, you know what, we have a machine that sees the amount of anger and bitterness you have on the inside towards this coworker or towards this other church member. They won't do that. You cannot get arrested or indicted for those things. And you won't even need Viola Davis and her crack legal team to defend you because all of these things that I've just mentioned are ways that you can get away with murder. But here's the thing that we need to face up to if we're followers of Jesus. If Jesus is king of our heart, and Kevin did such a great job last week, that you can have all the right external actions. You can look like you're an amazing Christian on the outside by going through all the motions. But what God is doing is he's looking at our heart. So if you have your Bibles, look at Matthew chapter 5, 
verse 21 through 26. We're going to start verse 21. And we will see truly if we can get away with murder. Verse 21 says this. You have heard the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. So Jesus quoting the sixth commandment in the uh, Ten Commandments. And he's also quoting Numbers 35, 31. And what the rabbis would do is they would say the ancients were told or ancients have said. It's a rabbinical phrase. And he's saying, you've all heard it said. You've all heard the Ten Commandments. You've all read Numbers 35. And you know there's serious consequences when you commit murder. And the rabbis of that day could easily say, I ain't never killed nobody. Right? That's what Numbers, uh, I mean, uh, Exodus 20 is talking about. It's not just talking about killing. It's talking about premeditated killing. It's talking about murder. They could easily say, I ain't never killed nobody. And you know what? We all do the same thing to try to justify ourselves. And that's what the Pharisees would do. On their sliding scale of morality, they would say something like this, just like we do. Yeah, you know what? I know I cheated on my taxes. Yep, I know I lied on my time card. I know I did those things. But I ain't cheat. I ain't ever killed nobody, right? I never killed nobody. Yeah, you know what? Uh, um, I, I stole money from my work or I embezzled money from work. Or you know what? I've gone to inappropriate sites, inappropriate websites and stuff. But I ain't killed nobody, right? Because we hold that as the lowest thing that you can do. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were saying, you know what? I know the Ten Commandments. I know the Decalogue. And you know what? I may have done some things, but you know what? I'm a pretty righteous person. I can pat myself on the back because I ain't ever killed nobody. And again, we do the exact same thing. But let's again look at what Jesus says in verse 22. He contrasts and he gives it the heart or the spirit of the law. But I say to you, and that word you is plural. I say to y'all that everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, or the Aramaic word reka or raka, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So this is what he's saying. He says, yes, if you slander somebody, if you gossip about somebody, if you vent to your community group about somebody, if you share a prayer request, if you murder somebody in your heart and you have hatred or anger towards them, yes, the secular courts, the police department will not arrest you and indict you. But he said, in God's courtroom, God looks at your heart. And he says, if you are angry with a brother, if they have caused you pain and now that pain has led to you being bitter and angry, he says, you're guilty in God's court. And he says, if you call somebody a good for nothing, the Aramaic word reka, empty headed, good for nothing. He says, you're guilty enough in God's economy. You're guilty and then look at this last example. He says, and if you call somebody a fool, the Greek word there is moros, moros. What word does that sound like, y'all? Aggies, right? I'm just kidding, y'all. It sounds like moron. He says, if you call somebody a moron, he says, you are guilty enough in God's economy to be condemned to hell. And that word there is Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. The place was a trash dump. He said, if you've got garbage in your heart, if you've got trash in your heart, he says, you might as well end up where the trash is burned and the worm does not die. It was the Valley of Hinnom, which was the garbage dump in that day. He says, that's where you belong. So he says, you may have gotten away with murdering people's character, murdering people on the inside, murdering people and, and murdering relationships, but God looks at the heart. First, uh, First Samuel 16, 7 says, man looks at the outward appearance. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Proverbs 21, 4 says it this way, haughty eyes and a proud heart and evil actions are all sin. He says, if you look with self-righteous, haughty, proud eyes and you have a proud heart and you look down on people, he says, even that, even though you've never raised a knife or pulled a trigger, he says, is sin. So here's the first principle. In God's courtroom, we can be guilty of murdering someone without actually murdering them. And we've all done it before. Now, here's the thing. Again, God looks at the heart. We look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And again, the Pharisees and those of us who battle, like all of us, wrestle with self-righteousness, say, you know what? I've never killed anybody. I've never been to jail. I've never been indicted. But God says, you know what? I look at your heart. 
and you've got anger, you've got bitterness, you've called people a moron, you've slandered people, you have vented about people. And he says, in my courtroom, you are guilty of murder. Um, I don't know if you've flown lately because of the COVID thing, but uh, a couple months ago I was flying before all the COVID stuff hit. And nowadays, if you know this, you go through the metal detector, but after you go through the metal detector at the airport, you go through what's called a body scanner. Have you all seen that? Where they have you stand on that little foot thing and you hold your arms like this. The original body scanners, this is what they did. They would use x-rays. And the x-rays would actually see through your clothing, see through your body. So if you swallow like balloons of drugs and ingested drugs to try to smuggle drugs, that body scanner would see the drugs. Nowadays, because of the risk of x-rays, they use what's called millimeter wave technology. It's a radio wave that can now look below your clothing. So if you've got a weapon that maybe got through the metal detector, or a knife or such thing, or a shank, if you've got drugs, it can see all those things. When you go like this, you may look all right on the outside, but the body scanner sees what you have on the inside. And you know what God does? The world, your work, uh, the church, everyone around you, they see what's on the outside, your outward actions, but God says, you know what? I have a soul scanner. I have a spirit scanner that digs deep and sees what's inside your heart. And he says, if you've got anger, if you've got bitterness, if you've got hatred, if you've got a, a, a mind that's already fantasizing about killing somebody, and if you've called somebody a moron or a fool, he says, in my courtroom, you're guilty. Maybe not in the world's courtroom, but in God's courtroom, you're guilty. And again, this is the general principle. And he uses the word y'all. It's the plural. But now this is what God does. God says this. Let me mention this too. Matthew 15, 19 says that murder, fornications, and adultery, they all start in the heart. 1 John 3, 15, John says it this way. He says, if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. So he says, they know that hatred, anger, strife, bitterness, those are all the things that eventually lead to murder and killing and jealousy and rage. So here's the application. He gives two applications. The first one is this, verse 23, therefore, and whenever therefore is therefore, you have to ask, what is it therefore? Because he's just said, in God's courtroom, if you've got anger, if you've called somebody a fool, he says, you are guilty. Therefore, if you, and now he's singular, and why does he go to singular? Because he's given the general principle to all of us. But now Jesus Christ has pulled up into your driveway. He's knocking on your door, and now he's sitting in your living room talking to you about your business, you specifically. So don't think about somebody else at Bayou City. Don't think about one of the elders, one of the pastors, or somebody in the community group. Jesus Christ is now sitting in your living room speaking to you. And he says this, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, verse 24, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So here's the first principle there, or the first application. What he's saying is this. Worship is important. Gathering online, or like these various prayer meetings we're having on Saturday nights and Sunday nights, they're important. When we gather again, it's important. When you give your offering, it's important. When you raise your hands in worship, it's important. But he says, more important than that, especially in this picture here, the offering is not talking about the financial offering he says, is you and I, if Jesus Christ is king of our hearts, if he is the president, the ruler over our hearts, transforming our hearts, we must be reconciled to our Christian brothers and sisters. And, uh, Christian brothers and sisters. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying that if you come together, now notice what Jesus does. He twists it because in verse 21 and 22, he says, if you have anger in your heart, if someone has hurt you, if someone has offended you, Someone has broken your heart and you've got anger. Forgive that person. Deal with that anger. But now he flips it and he says, you're getting ready to come to Bayou City. You're getting ready to present your offering. You're getting ready to take communion. And then you remember that somebody has something against you. First, you go be reconciled to that brother or sister in Christ. And here's the reason why he does that. I don't know about you. This is just me far less spiritually mature than many of you. This is what pride does. Pride causes us to be fragile and forgetful about how we've hurt others. But pride causes us to be fierce and focused 
when it comes to how we've been hurt. Y'all missed it. Pride causes us to be very fragile and forgetful when it comes to remembering who we've hurt. But it makes us fierce and focused when we have to think about and remember the people that have hurt us. Here's a test. Here's a test, y'all, if y'all don't believe me. Right now where you are, think about three people that have hurt you. Three people that have hurt you in the last week, in the last year, over your lifetime. Maybe it's that dad who abandoned you that wasn't there. Maybe it's that coworker who you told a secret to and they told the boss and they snitched on you. Maybe it's somebody at Bayou City. You can all, we can all remember very quickly and very easily people that have hurt us. Can you think of somebody that borrowed some money from you that you, has not paid you back yet? All of us can know people like that. I, I can think of someone right now. Now watch this. Can you think of right now three people that you've hurt, whether it's 10 years ago or even last week, three people that you lied about, three people that you slandered, three people that you borrowed money from? Can you name somebody that you borrowed money from that you have not repaid yet? All of a sudden, we're like amnesia. We forget and we're like, oh, I can't remember because it's our pride. We're a lot like our kids. If you've got kids, you know kids do this all the time. You know, you go to your son or daughter, hey, why haven't you cleaned your room yet? Uh, I, for, I forgot, I forgot, right? But then kids have this amazing selective memory. Then they do their homework and they said, mom, dad, can I have ice cream now? And you're like, did I say you could have ice cream? Yeah, you said on September 23rd, 2019, at 10, 13 a.m., that if I did my homework, I can have ice cream. And you're like, wow, that's amazing selective memory. But we do the exact same thing. And so what Jesus does here is he flips and he says, you know what? You're coming to gather for worship, which is important. You're coming to give your financial offering, which is important. You're coming to take communion, which is important. But when you're doing that, you remember suddenly, ah, there's someone that I know that I've offended, that I've hurt. Now here's the context. They're at the temple in Jerusalem. Many of the people will bring a lamb from their hometown and walk for miles and miles and miles over days and days to bring their offering to the temple. So imagine you've just walked two days. You've carried this lamb along. You're prepared to make your offering to lay your sins symbolically on this lamb because you've offended a holy God. And then you remember, I've offended this brother or sister in Christ. And so the second part of this application is now make every effort. Leave the lamb there. Walk all the way back to your hometown and get things right. The word reconciliation there is a word that only occurs here in the New Testament. Other variations or forms of it appear in other parts. And it literally means through change, through change. That you would go to that brother and sister in Christ that you know that you've hurt or offended and through change, you would change the relationship from being at odds with one another to now seeing eye to eye and being reconciled with one another. Now, let me mention this. Um, it's the one sided uh, of justice, the one sidedness of justice. I love it when I hear people say, justice for George Floyd, justice for Breonna Taylor. And it's always easy to look at justice when they need it applied somewhere else. But can you imagine how different this church would be, how different the Christian community would be if we fought for justice for the people that we've offended? How different our world would be, how different this church would be if when we've hurt others and we've offended others and we've been unjust to others, that we would say, you know what, I'm gonna make every effort if I need to walk 20 miles back home, if I need to, whatever I need to do, can you imagine if we fought for justice, not just for others, but even for those that we've offended, how different this church would be? And he says, you've got to make every effort to be reconciled. Um, I've been here now five weeks, and in talking to people here at Bayou City, members and staff members and elders, I know that there are staff members and members, elders, leaders, who are not reconciled with one another. Whether it's something that happened a week ago, something that happened seven years ago, eight years ago, three years ago, I know there are people that are not reconciled. And what Jesus is saying to this church is we must be reconciled. I know there are people who probably 
now recognize there are some things I did to hurt Pastor Curtis. Maybe I slandered him behind his back. Maybe I gossiped behind his back. Maybe I sent him a nasty email that now thinking about it came off in a very self-righteous tone. The Holy Spirit is moving and working in our hearts. And if this church is gonna be a reconciling church, we must be reconciled to one another. My prayer is this, is this, is that this church would be a hub for racial reconciliation. And I love that the church is now taking on racial reconciliation. It has become in the forefront of many of our minds. But here's the thing. If we are gonna get racial reconciliation right over hundreds and hundreds of years of offenses and injustice, and we can't even get personal reconciliation right. Man, we're in trouble, y'all. If we can't get personal reconciliation with another brother or sister in Christ that's just happened over the last year or the last month, how are we going to enjoy reconciliation of offenses that have happened over hundreds and hundreds of years? It would be like this. It would be like your child coming to you saying, we're going on a field trip tomorrow. Can I have $10 for lunch? And you give your child $10 for lunch. They take that $10. They come back to the field trip and you ask them, how's the field trip? How was lunch? And they say, oh, I lost the $10. Or I spent the $10 all on candy and junk food. And then the next day they come to you and say, mom, dad, in three years, I'm gonna be 16 and I wanna buy a new car. Can you give me $10,000? Do you think you would give that child who lost $10, $10,000? Because it's the principle of stewardship. And if this church cannot get personal reconciliation right, how are we gonna ask God to get racial reconciliation right in this church? Do I have a witness in here? My wife and I have given our lives to racial reconciliation, to urban ministry, and we're so excited and we're so stoked to be here. And we pray that this would be a hub that God would use to bring ethnicities and cultures together, to reconcile Japanese Christians and Korean Christians, black Christians and white Christians. But if we're gonna do that, we've gotta be reconciled to one another. Now, let me just give you this, some counseling from the pulpit. Here are three types of people that are very hard to reconcile with that we still need to make every effort to be reconciled with. Three types of people. The first one is Mind Reader Michelle. And if your name is Michelle, sorry, I didn't specify you. Mind Reader Michelle. Mind Reader Michelle is offended by this. They see your actions. They see what you do. And they have some ability now to read your mind and they know your motives. And they're offended by your motives. Very hard to reconcile with people like that because only God knows a person's motives. I don't know if you've ever been there where you know your motives are pure, but someone's offended because they think you have wrong or bad motives. Have you ever been there before? Right? Have you ever been there before? It happened to me just the other night. Thursday night, I was having dinner with Kevin and his wife, Hillary, and Johnny, his wife, Lindsay. And so all of us have kids. And so Hillary says to Lindsay, they've got young kids, maybe one day your kids, your daughters can watch babysit for my girls. Maybe your daughters can babysit my kids. And this is what I'm thinking, Kevin. I'm gonna be straight up with you. I'm sitting there and I'm the, my wife and I are the only non-whites at the table. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, wow, we've got two daughters too. And Hillary didn't ask us if our daughters wanted to babysit their kids. Hmm. Maybe they're racist and maybe they don't want some colored girls watching their white kids. And I was thinking that for a very split second, Kevin, very split second, because I know Kevin and Hillary. Matter of fact, uh, Kevin and Hillary and I, after uh, the uh, dinner was over, we were in the driveway for another 20 minutes talking about Johnny and Lindsay and how messed up they are. Just kidding. <laughs> There's a level of trust there. And this is what dawned on me. The Holy Spirit said this to me. Icky, Hillary is not gonna ask you and Tara to have your girls watch their girls or babysit their kids because, duh, they're in college. They're not home. One is in Abilene. The other one's in San Antonio. Lindsay and Johnny's daughters, they live in Houston. They live like 10, 15 minutes away from where they live. Of course they're not gonna ask you that. And so I had to say, you know what? I know Hillary and Kevin's motives are pure. They're not racist motives. But you, have you ever been on the victim end of that where someone looks at your pure motives and automatically jumps to the worst? 
So it's very hard to reconcile with mind reader Michelle. Second one is this, read my mind Ralph. Read my mind Ralph is the opposite. Read my mind Ralph, you know he's upset with you. You know he's got beef with you. He's got an issue with you. And then you say, hey Ralph, what's going on? Like you were in my community group and you stopped coming. What, what's going on? And this is what they say to you. If you really cared for me and if you really knew me, you'd know, right? Have you ever been there before? Right, you'd know. And you're like this, and this is what you have to temper it with. You have to say, you know what? God has not given me the ability to read minds. Please help me. Please help me. And hopefully they will be honest enough to share what you've done to offend them. So that's another person. And the last one is angry, irrational Andy. And again, if your name is Andy, I apologize. Angry, irrational Andy. And that's the person who is so angry and it's built up and now they become irrational. And you're like trying to talk to them and say, that wasn't my motive, that's not why I did that. That's how it may have appeared, but that was not my intent. But they're so angry, they become irrational. So in those situations, give them time to cool down. Don't deal with the situation immediately. Even maybe even bring a mediator into that situation. Um, so again, he says, faith, community, those things are important. But before you get to those things, he says, if you know that you've offended somebody, if you can humble yourself and recognize, I've hurt that person, I've done something to offend them, go be reconciled to that person first. Uh, many years ago when I worked for Dr. Evans, what I would do is, um, uh, he would, he's on 1,500 radio stations around the world, and people would call in and they'd have questions. The questions that the call center couldn't answer, they would get thrown to me, and so I would get the most difficult questions. And I remember on one occasion, there was a guy that called, he called like every other week, every month, and his questions always had to do with money and tithing and giving. And this is the questions that he would ask. He would say, all right, he said, Pastor Icky, I said, yes, and he said, suppose I'm taking some church members to Sunday school, and I've just picked them up. On the way there, I get a flat tire and the flat tire is irreparable, and I have to take it a discount tire, and they charge me $200 for a new tire. And he would say, can I count that towards part of my tithe? And I'm like, well. Then he said, well, you know what? And then at Sunday school, I volunteered in the youth Sunday school, and last week I brought some Twinkies and some Sprite soda for like $3.93. Can I count that as part of my tithe? And he was serious. He wanted to... Give reasons on why he didn't need to give. That was what he's asking. Give me some reasons when I don't need to give. And sometimes I want to joke with him and I'd say, well, if it's Twinkies and Sprite, no. But if it's like Ho-Hos and Ding Dongs and Coke, you're good, right? But I didn't say that and because he was looking for a reason not to give. And here clearly, I believe Jesus gives us a reason not to give. He says, if you're preparing to give your financial offering, your tithes and your offerings, and you know that you've got a brother or sister that you have offended, you've hurt, keep that right there. Put it right there. Go make things right. And then after you've made things right, you've made every attempt because Romans 12, 18 says that. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Then come and make that offering. The next picture here, the next picture is this. Verse 25. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you, singular, are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you, singular, will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. So application number one is this. If Jesus king of your heart, be reconciled to your Christian brother and sister and make every effort to do it. Application number two. If Jesus king of your heart, then be reconciled with non-Christians and don't put it off. Be reconciled to non-Christians. 1 Corinthians 6 says that we as brothers and sisters in Christ and the community of faith should not take one another to court. Most likely here, this is a non-Christian, a non-believer, someone who's not in the community of faith, who you owe money to, who says, I'm tired of waiting on you to send your rent check in or whatever it may be, and now they've taken you to court. And what he's saying is, before you get to the court and before you get to what's the judge and the officer and be thrown in prison, before you get to all the bureaucracy and the red tape, make things right with that person. Reconcile with that person. Try to work out a deal with that person. Saying, look, I'll give you 100 today, another 100 next week. I'll give you this in collateral. Work things out before you get to the court. 
So the principle here, the application in here is to be reconciled with non-Christians. Don't procrastinate. Don't procrastinate. Don't procrastinate. And if you don't know what the word procrastinate means, email me later this week and I'll give you a definition about that. That's a joke, y'all. That's a joke, y'all. All right. So he's saying for us as believers, because 1 Timothy 3.7 says this. 1 Timothy 3.7 says the qualifications for an elder is this, that you'd have a good reputation with outsiders, with non-Christians. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, says that the early church had favor even with non-Christians. He says, if we are going to uphold the, the, the reputation, the glory of Christ and the body of Christ, we have to be in good relation with non-Christians, if we've wronged them, if we've hurt them, if we've offended them. So he says, make things right before the consequences get too severe. Uh, many years ago, when I was a young preacher, I remember doing my very first funeral. And the very first funeral I did, I did it with another pastor. And here I was, fresh out of seminary, in my hand-me-down suit, my hand-me-down tie. And this guy had this really fancy sport coat. It was so clean, it was so sharp, you could cut yourself. He had these really nice slacks. He had these Italian leather boots with, I think, their cro crocodile skin. And I was like, ooh, this guy is smooth. He was so sharp. And then he got up to give part of the eulogy, and he was just such a smooth talker, just so smooth and eloquent, just sharp, and just wowing and amazing the crowd. And he was such a charismatic guy. And I was like, wow, this guy's amazing. He's so sharp dressed. He's a smooth talker. He's charismatic. People just are like gravitate towards him. And I was very, very impressed with him until about a year later. I found out that he was involved in all kinds of illicit business deals. He had stolen from a car dealership, from a dental office, and all kinds of stuff he was doing. He later moved from Austin, and he moved to Greater Houston. And you know what I found out recently? He opened up a contracting business where he remodeled homes. You know what happened? He did some folk wrong, and he got taken to court. He got taken to court and his church got shut down as well. And so it's important for us as Christians, whether you're a pastor, an elder, a member, whoever you are in Christ, if you've hurt somebody who's not a believer, to make things right, to be reconciled with that person. Um, so again, this is what Jesus is saying. The reason why the Pharisees fell short, because the law was there to basically show you you need somebody to clean you up from the inside out. You need somebody to forgive you from the inside out. This whole Sermon on the Mount is all about Christ's kingdom, the fact what, what life looks like when he rules. It's an upside down, inside out kingdom. And this is a, the good news, just like he says in verse 22. If you've got anger or bitterness, or you've offended somebody, you've hurt somebody, if you've got guilt that weighs you down or conviction that weighs you down, Rather than trying to just hold it all on the inside, because God sees it anyway, before it gets extreme and is seen in perhaps an actual murder, you lashing out, you saying things that you regret later, you cutting off friends, before it gets to that point, deal with the mess, the trash that's in your heart. I was reminded of that recently. I came home on Thursday night, uh, again, after having dinner with Kevin and Johnny and their wives, and we came home. And our house, and you've been here before, it smelled like rotten fish. It dawned on me, it dawned on me, that a few nights before we had had some salmon. Now here's something I've learned in my study of all cultures around the world. One thing I love about studying cultures, about preaching and leadership and things that cultures value and don't value is that certain cultures are different. But here's something that's almost universal, whether you're married, single, black, white, Hispanic, or Asian, is this principle in the home, whether you have roommates or you have kids or it's just you and your wife, whoever it is, or your spouse, this is a pretty universal principle, is this. If you have a trash can in the kitchen, behind the kitchen sink, the principle is this, whether it's for your kids or anybody in the house or your roommates, when the trash can is full, whoever finds a trash can full does what? takes the trash out. But here's what happens. Here's what happens. I don't know if it was a fish smell that was like making me a little bit woozy, but as I was getting ready to deal with the trash, God began to speak to me, Kevin. God began to speak to me. God said, Christians are just like that trash can. 
And I said, why, God? Because sometimes we're plastic and fake. He said, no, 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 that's not it. He said, because sometimes we get full of trash, guilt, anger, bitterness, jealousy, envy. And rather than dealing with it, like many of us do, when we find it full, we say, it's full, but I can push it down more, right? And so we push it down and we compress it and say, it's not fully full. Let me see how much more I can put in so that the next person who comes along has to deal with it. And so we put all of our junk and our trash in here and our mess. And here's the thing. You can keep pushing it down and stuffing it down and stuffing it down. But eventually, this is what happens. You notice the lid is open. Eventually, what's pushed down on the inside, the jealousy, the insecurity, the guilt, the conviction, the bitterness and anger, all that is pushed down on the inside, eventually what's on the inside becomes evident on the outside, y'all. Are y'all with me? What you think is hidden and covered on the inside, eventually you keep pushing that stuff down. Jesus says, you're guilty in the court, in the Supreme Court. You're guilty enough to go to hell. You keep trying to stuff all that down. He says, God sees it, and eventually it will come out externally. As a matter of fact, just like that rotten salmon, eventually it will stink up the whole atmosphere if you keep trying to push all that stuff down. And then God said this to me, but here's the good news, Icky, here's the good news. If you are willing to deal with that trash, if you're willing to deal with that garbage, if you're willing to deal with the insecurity, the sin, the bitterness, the anger and the guilt, if you're willing to deal with that and reconcile with your brother and sister in Christ, if you're willing to reconcile with that coworker who's not a Christian yet, if you're willing to do that, you have a garbage man. And I said, God, I have a garbage man? If you're willing to, rather than stuff all that down, if you're willing to now deal with the trash, deal with the insecurities, and take it out, he says, if you're willing to deal with it, Take it out, remove it, rather than hiding it in your heart, having that bitterness, venting to your community group, and you say, you know what, I'm done with this trash. You have a garbage man, Icky, who's willing to take away any trash that you have stuffed down on the inside. You have a garbage man who's willing to take away any of your sin, any of your mess, any of your guilt. He's willing to take it every and all away. And so you're wondering now, Wait, I have a garbage man who's willing to do that? Who is that garbage man? I have a garbage man who's willing to separate my sin as far as east is from the west. Who is that? Well, John the Baptist said it this way. When he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the garbage, the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Paul said it this way. Paul said it this way. He says, To him who knew no sin, He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. John the apostle in 1 John 3, 5 said it this way. Jesus Christ appeared to take away the sin of the world, to take away your mess and my mess. And so here's the good news. Rather than pushing down that bitterness and guilt, pushing down that anger, pushing down that insecurity, pushing down that jealousy and envy, God says it this way. If you're willing to deal with it, rather than stuffing it down, Jesus Christ will take it all away if you'll give it to him. Are y'all with me? And that's good news, y'all. And that's what the Pharisees missed. They were so content on living externally, being looking good and feeling good that they never dealt with the stuff on the inside. And the Sermon on the Mount deals with this. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ is about us allowing Jesus to rule as king of our hearts. And if he's done that, if he's done that, if you've been hurt, You've got bitterness and anger. Ephesians 4.32, forgiving one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Forgive that person. If you've hurt somebody, humble yourself. Remember who you've hurt. Don't become fragile and forgetful. Remember who you've hurt and be reconciled to that brother and sister in Christ. Make every effort to do that. If you have hurt somebody who's not a Christian, you've offended somebody who's not a Christian, Reconcile, make things right with that person as well and do it quickly before the consequences add up. 
We've got an amazing prayer team who's gonna be available till 11.30. If you are here today and the Holy Spirit has convicted you, conviction is one thing. I, I love it when people say, God, use you to convict me. But now God is calling you to take a step of action. He's calling you to take a step, a step of action. God has convicted you and placed a person's name on your heart, somebody that you've hurt, that you've offended, somebody here at Bayou City, somebody who's at another church. And here's the thing, nowadays this is so hard for us because rather than reconcile, we'd rather just burn the bridge and start going to a new church. And that happens all around Greater Houston. Rather than getting uncomfortable, dealing with a little bit of conflict and reconciling with a brother or sister in Christ, we just choose to leave this church and find another church. But if God has placed on your heart, on your mind, someone that you need to reconcile with, our prayer team is available and they would love to pray with you. Find someone to hold you accountable to do that. And if there's someone you need to forgive, would you release that offense and release the offender today? Let's pray. God, we're so grateful that we have a garbage man, someone who's willing to take away our garbage, our mess, our filth. Thank you that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God and we worship the Lamb today. We exalt the Lamb today because our insecurities, our fears, our anger, our bitterness, our guilt, our conviction, he takes away. God, I pray that it would move us to action. God, in a church of this size, in this stream that's going on all around the world, there are people that the Holy Spirit is placing on our minds right now that we need to be reconciled with, that we need to ask forgiveness, that we need to repent and confess our sin. God, move on our hearts to action. God, whether it's a phone call that needs to happen as soon as this gathering is over. Maybe it's a lunch that has to happen as soon as this lunch is over. Maybe it's a father going to his kids asking for forgiveness. Maybe it's a wife going to her husband asking for forgiveness. Maybe it's a roommate going to another roommate and asking for forgiveness. Maybe it's a coworker going to another coworker. A member of Bayou City going to another member. A leader, a member sending a letter to Pastor Curtis asking for forgiveness. God, you will not use this church to reconcile the greater things if we're not willing to do the lesser things, the smaller things. If we're not willing to practice personal reconciliation. God, you're going to have a hard time with racial, even social reconciliation through this church. So Master, we beg and plead with you that your spirit would fill us and empower us to do your will. Lord, we crown, we enthrone Jesus Christ, our Savior, as Lord and King of our hearts. God, you have a soul scanner, a spirit scanner, a heart scanner that sees down to the very depths of our heart and our soul. You see what others cannot see. You see our motives. You see our heart. So God, we come before you now admitting that we are guilty guilty of hatred, guilty of anger, guilty of murdering people in our hearts. But we enthrone Jesus Christ as Lord, as King of our hearts, cleanse us, change us from the inside out. We give all of this to the garbage man, the Lamb of God, the King of Kings, our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said,